titled this book Illegitimate Son for a reason. You know, the sun rises, mm-hmm. you know, and, and raising four children without a father in the house, you know, back then we would characterize as illegitimate. And I want anyone to feel that maybe they, maybe maybe the luck wasn't on their side. Maybe it was going on the other side of the track, or maybe there's some other limitation to what it is that you may have in life. But that shouldn't stop you from being the best version of who you are. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. My guest today was born in an impoverished neighborhood in Columbia, South Carolina, and might never have left Cherry Street if it weren't for his mother's inspiration. Determined to make his mom proud and her sacrifices meaningful, he embarked on a worldwide journey of military service, secret communications, and international espionage. His book, Illegitimate Son, is a true spy memoir of overcoming a difficult life start to serve his country and work in top CIA, FBI, and military counterintelligence and with law enforcement officials in the spy world. Motivational and inspiring, this incredible story of a mother's wisdom, self-discipline, triumph, and intrigue will help you crack the code to life's most important lessons. I'm pleased to present Kenneth Earl. Kenneth, are you ready to share your story of hope? Yes, I am, Tamara. I've been looking forward to this and uh, looking forward to the interview, so absolutely. Oh, well, this is gonna be so fun. And I'm just really excited that you could come on and and share this, not only uh, memoir to your mother, but how it, life took you on this crazy journey. So first, let me just ask you this. You are a naval cryptologist. First of all, what is that and what led you to that field? <laughs> <laughs> well, good question. And I gotta honestly admit, when I was recruited by the naval recru- the Navy recruiter, I didn't know what one is, so I would uh, <laughs> I would explain that and, and for your audience as well. So, obviously, uh, you know, I joined the military when I was in high school. It was uh, my senior year in high school, and my two best friends, or two of my friends from high school, they had joined the Navy. And you know, I was an athlete in high school and um, didn't get an athletic scholarship, and I needed to figure out what I wanted to do. And I I, t- I spoke with my basketball coach, and he said, "Hey, Craig, you know, I'm a what Army veteran." You can uh, join the military, learn a trade, get an education, serve your country, travel the world, and play basketball. I said, you can go all five of those things? He said, yes. So um, then after that conversation, I ran into my best friend, and we had this conversation. They told me they would join the Navy. Long story short, uh, I met with the recruiter. He gave me what they call an ASVAB test. It's a basic aptitude test. And I took the test, and I did pretty well. And then he said, hey, you did pretty well. Do you want to take another test for languages? And it's a, and I said, sure, not a, not a problem. I took another test. It's called a D-Lab. It's a defense language aptitude battery. And mm. uh, it's a test to test your ability to learn foreign languages. Ooh. And apparently I did well on that too. So months later, I find myself after joining the Navy at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, where I was mm. signed up to be a Russian linguist. What the heck? What is that? Wow. And, uh, and they put me in Korean, and after eight months, I got reclassified as a cryptologic technician communications. So you asked the question, what is a cryptologic technician? Yes. Well, cryptology is the study of cryptograms and secret codes and messaging. So the short of it is this, is within the military and within our, and within our government, you know, we have, in order to protect our communications, we have to encrypt them. So it's just almost taking a plain conversation like we're having today Mm -hmm. and you use technology and other, you know, other methods to scramble those messages. And then on the other side, you decrypt them. And what I did for 21 and a half years was to protect those, you know, secret or classified communications. And whether that was supporting some Marines or aircraft or special operations or even some of the, you know, clandestine level work. That's what I did. And um, 
That's really cool. That's really yes. neat. So let me ask you kind of a follow up question to that. How mm -hmm. did growing up on Cherry Street, what did that look like for you? And and how did your mom influence that life that you have led so fully now? Oh, just just lots of love. Um, you know, my mother was a single mother of four children. Um, she was born in the Depression era, um, 1937. In, in the segregated South, um, Jim Crow era. And she um, became pregnant with my older brother at age 17. So she had to drop out of high school. So she ended up getting a general education diploma. And then my other brother came and then my sister and then myself. So she had four children at a very young age in the segregated South with no real, you know, formal education in terms of anything, but, you know, general education diploma, which is fair but she never went on and had any advanced, advanced degrees. So how did, how, what did that look like? Yeah. One thing I can tell you, it was just a lot of love and a lot of praying. And mm -hmm. uh, she was a definite, uh, my mother was highly intelligent. It's just that, you know, those times were very hard for someone raising children, but she wanted a better life for all of us. So she was a great example of strength, courage, and what I can say is integrity. And that's what she wanted for all of us. And she worked really hard. She started off as a cook in the kitchen and she worked her way up to be a top, um, a top nurse's aide, where nurse's aide, where she garnered the respect of veterans who worked at a veterans hospital for 40 years. So the veterans, wow. the nurses, and the doctors. And Tamara, what was so amazing about her, um, those folks that had advanced degrees and families and better lives, they sought her out for her wisdom. She was so innately smart. And uh, that's what it was like. So she just wanted the best for us, hard work, dedication, treat people like you want to be treated. Uh, she was a lover of Psalms. And one of her favorite Psalms was uh, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. She prayed all the time. And uh, so I didn't know that we were kind of growing up poor because she, we always ate. I could tell you that. I was never mm. hungry, that's for sure. But we did, I did not really realize, you know, our state of being until I finally left, left South Carolina and like, whoa, you know, and I really saw the economic challenges that we've had. I've seen poverty around the world and I won't say it's anything close to what we may have seen in India and the other third world countries, not that India is third world, but they have some aspects of that. And, uh, but um, I didn't realize growing up that uh, those times were that tough because she made a way out of no way. And I can mm -hmm. tell you it's because I believe in God and and in Christ, and she prayed a lot. So growing up was a, a lot of discipline, a lot of treat people like you want to be treated, and just a lot of life lessons. Mm. Oh, that is that is such a beautiful tribute to your mom and mm -hmm. and her determination to do her best, and that God opened doors for her. And yes. I think I think that's the neat thing about sometimes when you're at rock bottom, and you're like. I don't know how I'm going to get through this, that God sees a way. And yes. as long as you you keep connected with him, he kind of helps guide your path. You know, for her, it was getting her GED and yes. moving on up and being able to right. serve veterans and, and and just being able to provide for her family. What what an inspirational woman. It, oh, my it was, goodness. And, and, yeah. And I have to say, you know, and she worked hard. And you see, if you can see in the background here, this is the wooden house we, we stayed in on Cherry Street. It's no longer there. Cherry Street is still there, and the neighborhood is still relatively the same uh, from an economic perspective. But she worked really hard, and in 1968, at five years old, so um, there about sometime after this photo, we moved off of Cherry Street, and she moved us out of that neighborhood. She built us, she moved to a better neighborhood. She had worked up, saved enough money to do that because that's what she did. She worked really hard, and seeing that was definitely inspiring for all of our children. My older two brothers, one, the uh, oldest one went into the U.S. Air Force and did 24 years. My second brother, he went in the U.S. Army where he was a top soldier. Um, my sister went to college and you know, my mother, mother struggled to put her through. But, you know, um, I was the last one and I ended up uh, going into the Navy, U.S. Navy, spent 21 years currently in the federal government, did very, very well in the military. Um, I can say to you something ironic that I discovered when I was writing this book um, illegitimate son, S-U-N, um, I, um, I realized when I left home, I was 17, and she was 17 when she had my brother. 
Mm. And someone had asked me, like, you know, what was that like when you told her you was going off to the military? How did she feel? And the only thing I could say was, and I remember and I reflected on it, Tamara, that she was happy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, and I was happy too. I was happy to leave, right? Mm -hmm. But she was really happy. But what didn't dawn on me at that time was she had spent her whole, might as well say her whole life from age 17 raising four children. So at the same age that I'm off shipping off and the last kid out of the house, you're talking about empty, what, what the empty bedroom syndrome or what do they call it? Empty. Empty nester. In, in empty nester. So I didn't even register at that time because I was thinking that's my mom, right? Mm -hmm. But she's thinking now I can have my life because <laughs> she had put so much into the veterans and raising four children. So, you know, at first I was like, well, she was just happy I was leaving. Not, not so much as much. She was probably happy to get her life back. And that being said, uh, I can say this. I, I, I can really to, truly credit her and, and a lot of the mentors and, and different um folks that have come in my life to, to help me to be where I'm at today. But the foundation for that was based upon her integrity and her wisdom and her character. And if there's one thing that I've taken from her is that, you know, having good personal, being a good character, you know, treat others like you want to be treated. Remembering the golden rule, all those basic things. And I can say fundamentally, you know, having those early lessons has really put me in the positions. It wasn't the education that I obtained or people I've met. It's just those fundamental things that she ingrained in me. And I just want to say this real quick. I cracked 10 codes, and that's the book says, the subtitle is How a Naval Cryptologist Cracked uh, the Code of Life Lessons. Mm. And remember, a cryptologist cracked codes, right? Yeah. So the life codes, one of them was uh, a mother's wisdom is indisputable. And that was the last of the 10 ones. And, and what I discovered through my life that a mother can influence good, bad, or indifferent. It is very, very powerful thing. And not having a father in the home, you know, I mean, I discovered that. I don't know if other folks can appreciate that, but if it wasn't for our mothers and our fathers, of course, we would not be here on this earth. And I felt like before I left this earth, I needed to do something to honor her. And I hope I get a chance to tell you what inspired that at some point. Yeah, tell me, tell me what inspired you writing this book, because obviously she was so influential in your life. Yes. So tell me the story behind the book. I was reflecting on my life. And, you know, I've never, you know, I haven't gotten married. I've never had kids. I've had a wonderful life. I've traveled the world. I did everything my basketball coach said I would. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just reflecting on my life. And, and I was thinking like, oh, wow, you know, if I were to, you know, unfortunately passed today, what would be left? And I was, the only thing I could think of, and I'll say, well, you know, if I pass, then my siblings and my nephews and nieces, they can get, you know, the assets that I have. And, and I'm like, God, how shallow, right? That's all I, I mean, I'm going to be left with just, okay, I have, there's some inheritance going to nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters. So I was thinking in the context of finances, right? Mm -hmm. I said, it has to be more than that. And then I was thinking, along with finances, well, I don't owe anyone anything. I don't have any debt. I don't owe anyone. And then I thought, well, yes, I do. I owe the lady who gave me life. Mm. I owe her. And then I'm thinking, well, how do I repay her, so mm. to speak? And I said, I'll write a book. I'll write a book that will have a legacy that will honor her. Oh. And when you open the book and the dedication, there's a picture of her right there. And it just says, you know, sunrise to sunset. And it shows her a beautiful picture of her. And it talks about, and I'll just read it, what it says. Dedication. To honor my mother, I wrote this book to give back what was given to me, the legacy of her character. Mm. And that's something that she gave me. And that's something that my nieces and nephews and sisters and brothers and friends and family, people that have loved her, could always cherish and this book will go on forever that mm -hmm. money will be spent so that's what really made me say i'm doing this mm -hmm. because at the end of the day you know um they said every man should you know at least have a son uh, uh plant a tree and will write a book i never had any kids i think i planted a tree in school <laughs> and, uh, but i wrote the book and it's probably the best thing i have ever done in my life. If you ask me, Craig, what is your greatest accomplishment? Honoring my mother. Mm. Because she was one terrific 
fantastic human being. And I can't wait one day to, to see her um, uh, when that time comes. And that's mm. what this was about. Mm. That is what, a, what an incredible story behind the story, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. And it's true that it's interesting that stories are what influence people, right? Yeah. That her life and example influenced you, and now you can share those same stories with others, right? So tell me, what were some of the other codes that you cracked yeah. as far as life goes and some of the stories behind cracking those codes for you? Oh, wow. Well, let me tell you. Thank you for asking. Um, you heard me talk about character and integrity. Yes. Each chapter of the book is a story. So they're individual oh. stories, like, you know, almost like songs. Remember, she was a learner of songs. And it shows the trials and tribulations of this kid growing up through life, right? And it's mm -hmm. interesting. So one of them was, you know, character and integrity is worth something. Now, I think in today's age, I just thought it was important to do that because, you know, we, we live in a world of mis and disinformation and, you know, people aren't always truthful. But, you know, I, I, I told, I'll tell you this. Um, my mother had me believing as a kid that only bad people tell lies <laughs> and she, oh, and I'm serious. So she taught me like, Craig, if you ever, if you ever, if you ever get in trouble for lying or stealing, I'm not, if you go to jail, I'm not going to ever visit you. I'm like, mom, <laughs> really? You know, I mean, I mean, and I know that don't sound too, very, too sophisticated, but what I want you to know is it worked. Right. Mm. And I don't know how you you know, keep your kids and, and, you know, along those lines, but that's how she did it. Okay. So character integrity was one of those codes. It's worth something. I think people need to understand that despite what happens on the internet and what happens in life, you have to have good character and have good integrity because it is worth something. Another one, which is huge. And um, I heard one of your guests speak about this mistakes and failures should be options for growth. That's what, that's one of the codes. You know, mm. what I've discovered is some of the best lessons I have learned is from some of the mistakes and some of the things that I've failed. It's just not staying there. So I think a lot of folks, particularly when I would join the military, I was taught failure is not an option. And mm. you're in your head and you're afraid to make mistakes. But what I've discovered is that that is probably some of those best teachers. So can you give me an example from your life or perhaps the life of your mom where you had something that you were able to learn from. Yeah, I, I will tell you, it, there's a chapter in the book and you know, it's not the most, it's not the proudest moment here that I ever had about mistakes and failures. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I, was, I was 17 years old, coming from South Carolina, went in the military, traveled to California. I've never seen anything like it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, um, you know, at age 18, I turned 18 while I was in the military. I, I gotten into a, a a, let's just call it a conflict or confrontation with a young man. And I, I didn't go and tell anyone the following week I saw him and, you know, out of fear, I kind of, you know, um, took matters into my own hands and I ended up getting into some trouble. And I'm not, I'm not proud of this to me, but it's in the book. So I'm going to share it with you. When the authorities came, I found myself running and I hid on top of a building for five hours at night and they had a manhunt going on, some, something out of a movie. Uh -huh. And all thing I could do was pray. And this is a part I know you appreciate. And I prayed to God that he would send me an angel because I am in some trouble. And I did not want to be sent home and, 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 and not make my mother proud. And I said, God, if you please, if you get me out of this situation. And sure enough, I turned myself in and you know, I went through a process. And, and, and I met this Marine Corps gunny sergeant. He was, he was a Vietnam veteran with a raspy voice. I described him in the book. And this man, I told him the story of what happened. And he said, you know what? I really understand why you did what you did. But you can't take matters into your own hands. And that was your mistake. You should have went and told what happened to you instead of you know, taking it on. But he thought because of my good character and the kid that I was, I was a kid at that time. He ingrained that in, he, he embraced me, he went to bat for me. My instructor at that time, he went to bat for me. And I went through this process and, and all, the, all the charges, the military charges were just mm -hmm. dropped. Oh, and they nice. talked about the potential that this young man had. 
And from that day on, I went from what we call E1 to E9. That's the highest ranking listed that you can go up to. Only one point, only one one percent of the military get to that rank. Um, and I just turned my life around. And the reason why I shared that, that that chapter on mistakes and failures is because I had made that mistake, but I had been given another chance. And I took full advantage of that. And, and, and sometimes it's making those mistakes and not staying there is there. But also to, you know, I did pray to God <laughs> to help me. And that angel that he sent me was that Marine Corps gunny sergeant. So I think the lesson and the takeaway from that is to, you know, if you make a mistake, just don't stay there. Stand up and be a person of good character. We all going to make mistakes, whether it's a situation like I described, which was very dramatic, and I was trying to be dramatic. But the truth is, there's small things, too, that will um, sometimes get us down or say we, I mean, something to spell on a test or someone, you know, maybe just the mistakes that we just make. We just can't stay in those things. It's not the falling down. It's the not getting up from those things. And uh, so I think that's the takeaway from that. And hopefully that was useful. Oh, it is. And, and I love how you prayed for an angel. You know what I mean? I did. Yes, indeed. And, and God answered you in a way you probably wouldn't have seen that guy initially and thought, here's my <laughs> angel, right? <laughs> yes, that's, that, yes, it was. And I mean, he gave me a hard time now. I mean, he, he didn't like the fact that, you know, when you're young, you just don't know how to negotiate problems. And I think that's mm -hmm. another takeaway. If you kind of look at the part of that chapter, it's kind of like describing a, a youthful 17 year old coming from Cherry Street. Now he's in the military. And, you know, now in life, you, you can't use, you can't take the matters into your own hands. Sometimes you got to use your intellect. You have to be smart. You got to be above those things. And that was the lesson was, okay, you know, find other ways to negotiate these things. And and like I said, the only thing I could think to do on top of that roof was pray because there was nowhere to run. I, mm -hmm. I run, they couldn't find me. You know, <laughs> so I was left with God. And, yeah. and thank God for mother teaching us to pray. She made us get on our knees every night. And I remember, you know, I have memories of, of being on the side of the bed with my sister, like that you see here, uh -huh. just praying, you know, you know, uh -huh. no, no, he laid me down to sleep, you know, yeah. and uh so I remember all those things. And those were those lessons that she taught and ingrained in us. It's interesting how those lessons that mothers teach us come back yes. at just the right time, at just the right moment. I know there's a verse in the Bible, I think it's in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. where it talks about training up a child in a way they should go, and when they're old, they will yes, depart from yes. it. And, and I think some, so many times mothers beat themselves up. Oh, my kid made this bad decision. My kid made this bad decision. But... I think the point that you're making here is, yeah, kids are going to make bad decisions, but yes. what what mothers teach comes back yes. into their minds at the yes. right time, exactly. you know, to kind of inspire them. And, and when you're on those, I'm stuck on a roof moments, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they'll remember to turn to God, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the metaphor. And that's, you know, and for, for folks and friends that have read that book, they understand it. And the truth is, I'm just telling you, it was those fundamental things that allowed me to, you know, ascend to where I'm at right now. It wasn't a degree. It wasn't, you know, of course, those things contribute to it. But I'm saying the fundamental foundation is what my mother had established. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, a mother's wisdom is indisputable. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, or indifferent, it is going to have an impact on that child. Oh, absolutely. So mom's out there, do your best. Yes. <laughs> and trust that God will help your kid figure out the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Hope they get those messages, right? No, absolutely. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, now take me through your career and some of the other life codes that you were able to crack. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, We'll have more lessons, tips, and things you can apply to your life. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Tamara K. Anderson, and I want to share something special with you. When our son Nathan was diagnosed with autism, I felt like the life we had expected for him was ripped away, and with it, my own heart shattered as well. It's very common for families to feel anger, pain, confusion, and anxiety when a child is diagnosed. This is where my book, Normal For Me, comes into play. It shares my story of learning to replace my pain with acceptance, peace, joy, 
and hope. Normal for Me has helped change many lives, and I'd like to give this book to as many families as possible. We put together something I think is really special. My friends and listeners can order copies of my book at a significantly discounted price, and we will send them to families who have just had a child diagnosed with autism or another special needs diagnosis. We will put your name inside the cover so they will know someone out there loves them and wants to help. I will also sign each copy. You can order as little as one or as many as hundreds to be shared with others. So go to my website, TamaraKAnderson.com and visit the store section for more information and to place your order. You can bless the lives of many families by sending them hope, love, and peace. Check it out today at TamaraKAnderson.com and help me spread hope to the world. Yeah. Now, now take me through your career and some of the other life codes that you were able to crack. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you can't buy peace of mind. So obviously when I retired, I, mean, I spent 21 in the years in the Navy, went from you know, the lowest listed rank to the highest, and I, I retired and I joined the federal government, started working in the intelligence community, doing some very special things. And um, what I can say to you is through that process, like I said, you can't buy peace of mind. And I think, you know, <laughs> through the trials and tribulations of dealing with people and dealing with, you know, worldly, global things, you know, oftentimes it kind of get it comes back to us. And I and I realized that um, if, you know, if you're going to be the best version of yourself, you have to really do the work on yourself. And I was always striving to have peace of mind, trying to have peace. And I just found out you can't buy it. It's not something, it's not a commodity, it's something that you really have to do work on. And along those same lines, I put overcoming and defeating yourself as freedom. What I've discovered is you have to really focus on trying to just be the best version of yourself. If you were to ask me, you know, um, am I, you know, am I there yet? I'm still not there yet. I'm still, you know, striving to be a better version. Hopefully I'll be better tomorrow than I was yesterday. But I, I really do think that we have to spend time, you know, whether that's praying to God or focusing on, on um, our own development, but I and one thing about mm -hmm. peace of mind, there's a quote in here, and I just want to read this to you. Yeah, man. please I think do. It's anonymous. If you want peace of mind, stop fighting with your thoughts. Ooh. And I think that's so powerful. If you want peace of mind, stop fighting with your thoughts. So we might think it's those external things sometimes that's bothering us, and it is. Those are real. Sometimes that could be a symptom. It could just be a sign of things. But I really do think if we want real peace. We got to stop fighting with how we think. I've come to that. And I think I have, I won't call it perfect peace, but I understand how to, you know, get that peace because that starts with who I am. Mm. Um, can, can you pull one of your life stories into that perhaps and share how, how maybe you weren't feeling peace because of a certain situation, how you were able to yeah, kind of yeah. change your thoughts or conquer your inner demons to mm -hmm. be able to find peace? Oh. So many. I'll just share one that came to mind. I worked in an office where we deal with what we call, you know, counterintelligence or counterespionage, you know, dealing with spies. I mean, mm -hmm. in real life. Okay. And it was fun. Coming to work every day, Tamara was like going to a movie. I work with the best trained spies in this world. And I'm not, I know you probably got to pinch yourself right now, but yeah. that's okay. It's true. <laughs> that's so cool. That's, that's what it was like for me. And it was so much fun because I did the cryptologic work. I did all this other stuff before working there, but this was different because I was dealing with what we call human intelligence. Mm. And um, so it was fun at first. And uh, it got to a point where I started getting a little paranoid. And mm. uh, I would come to work. I, I, I'll just tell you this. I came to work one day and it was early. And um, I came in my office. I had my own office and I found myself like looking in the ceilings for cameras. And I found myself looking under my desk for bugs. Now you might say, well, Craig, you know, it's like you're kind of losing it. Not really, okay? And uh, because I'm gonna kind of leave it at that. I had good reason to, to, to I wasn't imagining things. And, I'm, and the story, I mean, the book has it all detailed or what, how it led up to that. But what I would say to you is at that moment, I'm sitting here thinking to myself like, this is not normal. 
Hmm. This is not normal. And I wasn't having peace. I was having a lot of like, what is going on? I didn't know how to discern. Remember, I was taught that to be a person of integrity, a person of the character. So why am I in my job worrying about these kinds of things? And uh, to that degree, I had, it was very, very, um, I didn't have a lot of peace. Didn't sleep well. Um, it was part of the job. It was just something that just didn't cut well with me in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, what it is. I didn't have a, I didn't have an intellectual challenge with what we were doing to protect this country. Right, right, right. right. Not, not that, I mean, I, I love that. I still do similar kind of work now. But what I'm saying to you, I didn't have peace with, you know, some of the things that I was seeing and, and I started experiencing it myself. So, you know, the short of it is, you know, uh, I said, if I wanted that peace of mind, I needed to do something to, to change. And I, I just took myself out of that environment. And, um, and, and I, and I wrote something at the end of that. And I put, uh, I had lost my mother and my last love. I was not going to lose my mind. Mm. And, you know, to that extent, remember too, how we think, you know, it influences what we do. I, I found another place of employment. Okay. Oh. Uh, that, and I, I did get promoted out of that, but that experience, right. Of just knowing, and it was a good experience. It wasn't all bad. It was just that that's where that whole thing about peace of mind came. And then I started doing, I did a lot of self-reflection. Um, and I do kind of talk about that. I started focusing on what, what is success? What is, what am I striving? What am I trying to do? So I had to just kind of reassess my life. And so I just did a lot of self-reflection. I did a lot of I started focusing on them. If I'm being honest, I started focusing on Maslow's triangle of needs. And, and that's where the hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you and know, tell and me what looking. those are for the people who don't know. OK, so that's like self-actualization. So at the bottom of that pyramid, you know, uh, or that hierarchy, there's there's food, water, shelter. So all of us, in order to have life, we have to. You know, we have to eat, we have to breathe, we have to water. Those are those basic things that mm -hmm. maybe a parent may give to a child or even to grow up. So those are things that you have to have. If you don't have water or food, you're not going to survive. Mm -hmm. So as you move up that hierarchy at the next level, now you're talking about, you know, housing, shelter, you know, you know now you're talking about, you know, um, your self-esteem, your, your, the things that makes you who you are. And then you get to the top of that is how self-actualization. So I'm actually looking at this. So you go, it's the physiological needs at the bottom. Then it's the safety needs. That's the housing, the parents mm -hmm. and, and stuff over you. The social needs. So that's stuff we need for social stuff. And then you have your esteem. And at the top is actualization. Mm -hmm. So I already had all those things covered at the bottom of that pyramid. So once I got really the, when I got the esteem part down, then I'm at that top where we're focusing on actualization. And that is living up to your greatest potential. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, now obviously uh, I grew up from a praying mother, so I often prayed, but I did a lot of self-reflection, a lot of meditation, mm -hmm. a lot of that. And, um, and it's just so interesting when you start um, reflecting on the Bible and some of the things and some of the stories in the Bible, you know, which I didn't draw a lot of, you know, spiritual, religious aspects of it. But all those things kind of get back to those things, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I hear that, you know, God is inside of us. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think as you reflect on being the best version of yourself and actualizing as your greatest potential, somehow or another, you're going to you're going to connect those dots. So I would say the short of the story is what did I do? I focused on being the best version of myself. I stopped trying to, uh, you know, not to please others, but. I focused on uh, one of the codes that I cracked. I said, no matter what you do in life, no one can beat you at being you. So mm -hmm. Tamara, I focused on trying to just be the best version of who I was, mm -hmm. not trying to, you know, be that, do the top spy or be this person, or be that person, be who you are, who God made us to be. And um, one of the, I, I got to share this one with you. And I, I know you would appreciate this. Uh, one of the other codes I cracked was unhappiness and frustration are unproductive. Mm -hmm. And while I was, you know, doing my time of reflection, I thought about all the times where I would be unhappy and frustrated and things of that nature. And I realized that, you know, it's just not productive to be that. So I try not, just like mistakes and failure, you just don't want to stay there in the mistake and stay there in that failure. 
you don't want to stay in that unhappiness mm -hmm. because all that stuff is still internal and it's you know no happiness is not going to come from one side you can't go buy happiness mm -hmm. you can't go buy peace of mind mm -hmm. you know i shared a story about my sister and i opening up a store we just put a sign out there called a peace of mind <laughs> and we figure like if we do that, people come running to the door. We don't have to put nothing in the store because everybody wants it, right? And and it's the same thing with being unproductive and unhappy. And and I'm starting to learn that happiness is a skill, mm. right? It's something that we can practice. And again, it's all about how we how we might think and reflect on stuff. So I can say writing this book really has helped me to you know analyze my life. Um, and to just reflect on, you know, steps that I can do to just try to be a better person. Oh, it does. And, and if I could just pull on some of the yeah. lessons that you shared there, yeah. when you're in a bad spot and you're feeling yeah. unsettled to remove yourself from the situation, yeah. to do some self-reflection and, and yeah. decide if you're feeling those negative feelings have some prayers have some maybe journal a little bit meditate figure out okay i don't want to stay where i am how do i change that yeah. and what's cool about that is is that god will guide us to figure out what exactly we need to do in our particular situation because it's going to look different for all of us not all of us are in the navy you know yeah, that's right that's <laughs> and so right. he guided you to do exactly what you needed to do yes. just like he's going to guide each and every one of us to right. take the next right step for us but i liked that concept of if sometimes we have to move past our own demons to defeat yes. those those negative yes. self that negative yes. self talk yes. in ourselves yes. that paranoia and just yes. say okay let's focus on the truth and and happiness and progression reaching our best self yes yes I, I got to tell you I, you know you had asked me early on you know what was one of my favorite passages in the Bible and I said Philippians fourteen thirteen. 413 and says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And, you know, strengthens me. I can do all things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, I mean, obviously our parents, our influencers, our, our relationships, husbands, wives, doctors, you know, clergy, all of us can help influence and shape those things. But that strength is going to come from him to you, mm -hmm. not through someone else. You know, the validation has to start with yourself. I, I, I mean, we have to validate ourselves. We have to love ourselves so we can love others, love them clean with a clean heart and things of that nature. And all I can say to you is this, if I would have figured this out a long time ago, I wouldn't have had to go to write this book. I would have had to hide <laughs> on that roof, you know, but I think all of that, <laughs> I mean, all of those things that we go through in life, you know, they, they shape, they shape who we become. And I'm, I'm convinced, I'm convinced through, through my 58 years of life, uh, I'm convinced that no one can beat us at being us. So mm -hmm. we focus on just being that best version. If that's through the Bible, that's through you know, your own you know, relationship with God or, or even others, I'm just glad that I've had the, the, the good fortune to come here and, and share with you this story. And I hope it's very meaningful to you and your listeners and i hope it will oh well thank you for coming on now before we go yeah would would you take some time and tell us how we can find you and where we can buy your book as far as connecting with you and and yes. learning more about all of this wonderful this wonderful lessons that you've shared Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so there's a website. It's called illegitimate dash sun, S U N, not S O N. And also it's on Amazon. You know, you can order it at Amazon um, easily. A lot of folks have that. I mean, e and also Barnes and Noble. I mean, any of those platforms that you might use is there. Also, too, my, I can be reached at uh, Kenneth Thurl. I mean, at the site, there's an email if you want to contact me and, and talk about some of these things. Well, thank you. That is that is awesome. Mm -hmm. So, Kenneth, this has just been so much fun. Thank you for coming on today and for sharing not only such a beautiful tribute to your mom, but the hope that we can overcome these personal demons and, and become our best self. Yes. But one of the things I've just really drawn from your story today is mm -hmm. that 
no matter where we start, that we can progress and become probably something beyond our our possible imaginations when we involve God in it. Because I think God sees who we can ultimately become, and we've just got to trust him that some of those bumps in the road are going to get us where we need to go, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And, 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 and we've, I just have to comment on this, and, and I, I'm just going to be transparent here. I mean, we all know Martin Luther King, and uh, I remember something, you know, everyone knows about the, you know, I have a dream speech and things of that nature, but he had said something, and I don't know if he's the originator of this quote, because um, I've heard it in, in some other history books as well, but he, I heard him, and it's in my head, he said, if you can conceive it, and you believe it, then you can achieve it. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you this, I have for a very, very long time, I can't say I didn't believe it. I, not that I was skeptical, but I never felt like I could be anything that I wanted to be. The army had a commercial, you know, join the military, join the army and be all you can be. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, and, and you hear that from your parents and, and other folks that have made it in life, you know, from presidents and and other, you know, CEOs and everything. Oh, you can do anything you want to in life. And that's really hard to believe when you're coming from a place of lack or or in things of that nature. So I can't say that I always had that belief. But when you do get to, I did get to a point in life where I'm saying, it is so true. And I find myself giving those messages back to young people. I recently went to, back to South Carolina, it's Cherry Street, you know, visited that street. I actually went to a high school two weeks ago in South Carolina and spoke to um, what they call the junior ROTC Air Force students and kind of shared the story. Because what I'm saying is, and I did say they can be the best version of themselves. You can be, and I even quoted the Martin Luther King thing. And, and, and those messages, you know, it's kind of hard when you're coming from the neighborhood that I came from. It's hard to believe that, but it's true. And, you know, and obviously, you know, we have to be realistic with some of those things. But at the end of the day, you know, it is about how you might feel and think about yourself. And if you put the hard work into it, you can get there. And with the help of the Lord and prayers and friends and family and others, you can be that. You can be that best version of yourself, whatever that is, you know, whatever that is. I can just tell you I'm a better person than I was yesterday for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, and and that's that is what gives us all hope, right? That. We don't have to live in the past. We don't have to let our mistakes define us. We can use them to help improve and learn from, kind of like we were talking earlier. But but that we can, there is hope, be true and honest, kind of like your mama taught you, you know? Yes. <laughs> live with yes. integrity. And, yeah. and life will eventually work itself out. It, it will. It really will. Since writing this book, and having to do this live autopsy of my life to honor the person who gave me life, who, who gave me the, the wisdom, the integrity, the character, you know, because at the end of the day, that's, that's what I'm not here because of the degree or because I traveled the world. I'm telling you, it was because of those basic fundamental tenets of being a person of good character and integrity. And those are things that get us through. Psalms 100 is a is a popular song for you and your family on Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, wow. And what was so amazing about hearing you do that, it was a small clip, about three minutes. And what was so interesting and, this, and ironic for me was before the podcast, I was like, wow, you know, I, I guess I'll just have to express to her my gratitude. I need to, maybe I need to, maybe I need to Google something on gratitude or something, you know, because that's what I'm feeling. And I found that clip that you wrote about that and how you, you all do that every Thanksgiving. And it's just a tradition for both your families. And, um, and I was so moved by that because that's what I have, gratitude. And I'm just grateful to be with you here today and, um, and just know that that matters too and having gratitude. I know that's tied to the Bible. It really is. And mm-hmm. all these things that matter are free. You know, whether it's gratitude, being a person of good character, being having peace of mind, you know, you can't buy a good night. I said, you can't, you can, they said, you can, uh, you can buy a sleep mattress, what those sleep number mattresses <laughs> and those pillows, but that ain't going to guarantee you a good night's sleep. It's not. Go get the, go get that. It's not going to go by the house. It's not going to promise you a, a good night's sleep. That's something that comes inside you. And all I'm saying is that I know that there's something special about this podcast today. 
I'm going to figure it out. And you're going to be the first to know. And I'm going to say, this is what this moment has done for me. Mm-hmm. And again, I want to thank you and your listeners, you know, for this opportunity today, because I'm telling you, there's something very, very unique and special about what has happened to me in this podcast. Oh, well, thank you for being willing to share and and to share those moments in your life where, you know, you had to learn some rough lessons. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. And I didn't shy away from telling them either because, you know, um, I, I titled this book Illegitimate Son for a reason. You know, the sun rises, mm-hmm. you know, and, and raising four children without a father in the house, you know, back then we would characterize as illegitimate. And I want anyone to feel that maybe they, maybe maybe the luck wasn't on their side. Maybe it was born on the other side of the track, or maybe there's some other limitation to what it is that you may have in life, but that shouldn't stop you from being the best version of who you are. Because no matter where you start in life, you know, you can, you can, you can build on those things. You don't have to stay there, right? Yeah. And that's really ultimately what this was about. Thank you so much for sharing that and that we can all rise from wherever we are. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, subscribe so you can get your weekly dose of powerful stories of hope. I know there are many of you out there who are going through a hard time, and I hope you found useful things that you can apply to your own life in today's podcast. If you would like to access the show notes of today's show, please visit my website, storiesofhopepodcast.com. There you will find a summary of today's show, the transcript, and one of my favorite takeaways. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this episode with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a quote or a scripture verse that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this podcast. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and He will help you bear the burden. And above all else, remember God loves you.